Viewer discretion is advised. Your fave will be criticized. That's Jan. That's Chris. And welcome to CCTV, the nonstop pop show. And today we are heading to Pop 101 class and learning about the 2000s American pop group, Dream, with a very special guest member, Melissa Schumann. If you're wondering who we are, Shannon and I have a huge range of experience in the music industry from performing on stage to working at record labels. So we have a lot of insight into the crazy music industry. And if you like our content, please give us a like, a subscribe, a follow, a rating, so we can keep bringing you more. That's right. And let's get into it, all right? We're here at Pop 101. School is in, let's get it. Introducing our very special guest instructor, Melissa Schumann. Class is now in session. Hi! So welcome, Melissa, to the CCTV crew, and thank you so much for joining us on our show. How are you today? I'm doing good. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Oh, yeah, me too. <laughs> awesome. Yes, I was obsessed with Dream as a little 10-year-old kid in Hong Kong. So this is awesome oh. to be talking to you. And so we can now travel back in time to the late 90s. Melissa, we understand you were initially trained in and had a passion for musical theater. So what led to your audition for Dream and how was that whole process? That was incredibly random, to be quite honest. Um, I was a, I believe I was in the seventh grade, seventh or eighth grade. I can't really remember now. I think I was in the seventh grade. Um, <clears throat> and it was actually, um, I was studying with a wonderful, um, uh, he was a music director. His name's Michael Sarter. He's no longer with us um, anymore, but he's, he was amazing. Um, and I was one, one of his students. And uh, uh, basically, uh, a woman by the name of Judith Fontaine had reached out to him, basically saying that she was looking to put together a girl group. And she would like the names of his top five students. And I was one of his students. And so that's how I got the initial audition. I had, uh, I remember vividly, uh, my mom picking me up from school and being like, Melissa, you have an audition tomorrow. And I'm like, for what? Cause there was a, that's a whole backstory there as well. Um, but as I was surprised to have an audition at that point. And, uh, and so, yeah, I went and auditioned and it was basically this very large cattle call. Like I remember getting there and it, there was no, it, there seemed to be no direction. It, there was everyone from the ages of maybe 10 to 30. I don't even, they looked old to me, but I was also in the seventh grade. Um, um, and 30 was old when you're in the seventh grade, but, um, but yeah. And then I auditioned and then she selected, uh, five of us. And that was kind of the beginning of that journey. So that's how I got into the recording industry. But prior to that, I did nothing but musical theater uh, and, uh, I was, I was a musical theater geek. So <laughs> Same. That's how I got started. Too. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I did. Um, I did Damn Yankees and Bye Bye Birdie actually. Oh, and then, oh I, like, I love it. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> so I'm here with you. Okay, um, but, awesome. Yeah. So eventually, after a member switch and a name change from Final Warning, the the final line of of Dream was decided to be you. Melissa, Ashley, Holly, and Diana. And the group left its original manager, Judith Fontaine, and was signed by Sean Combs, aka Puff Daddy, aka P. Diddy, aka aka, to Bad Boy Records in 1999. So how did that happen? And what was your experience like working with him in the company? Um, so how did it happen? Yeah, I love it because that that little that little bio is, is a nice little clip note of kind of how, what happened. So basically we were with Judith Fontaine. Um, she had basically tried to um, get us signed with a bunch of like, go the European route. Cause at that time they were breaking all the acts like Britney, Backstreet Boys and Sync, all of them. And there was a ton of other ones that didn't make it. Um, but she had, and she actually had a couple other girl groups. One of them was called 17. The other one was called Risque, who actually was a phenomenal girl group actually in the, in the UK. I don't know how many people actually know about them, but um, so she was trying to shop us to like, you know, to go the European route and nobody wanted us. Specifically, Capitol Records turned us down and said verbatim, we sounded like a bunch of choir girls. And so I'll never forget that. That was the feedback we got. Um, we recorded a whole bunch of songs with, uh, 
uh, oh my goodness, not Enrique Iglesias, his brother Julio Iglesias. <laughs> I know, right? It's it's a little bit random. Of it. <laughs> random, right? But that was actually our first demos that we did was with Julio Iglesias' uh, uh, producer. Um, I, I don't remember his name, but that's where we got kind of our first taste in the, in the music, uh, in the recording studio was uh, with that particular producer when we were with Judith. But from my memory, I remember Judith not really able to break us. And she ended up setting up a, what she thought was a label meeting, which is a little shysty, okay? Uh, with 2620 and Clockwork and Clockwork Entertainment. And that was the production company that we ended up leaving Judith for and then going with them. And then it was basically Kenny Burns, who was a, a partner involved in that sort of, I don't know, production. Um, he had the relationship with Puff. So that's how we got him introduced with Bad Boy. A lot of people don't know that story or that part of the story because it's been simplified. It's been PR, you know, right. how do you package it? And we're, you know, but right. um, that's how we got introduced to Puff was through Kenny. Got it. Oh, wow. That's so interesting. So how was the whole team built around you? Obviously you were underage, so your yes. parents were involved, you had management, and then now you have kind of all the label people at Bad Boy and at production company. So like, what was the whole dynamic between the team there and how much say did you guys actually get as the actual group? We were treated like children. I mean, so, cause we were children, right? We were supposed to have our guardians. Our parents were supposed to be taking control of the business side, but even with our parents, our parents were incredibly green. They obviously had never worked in the recording industry ever. Um, and, um, and with that, you also, you have to imagine like, you know, eight or seven parents working together, that's complicated. You know, you're going to have a lot of different uh, opinions on things and, who people like and who people don't like to work with and that sort of thing. Um, but for the most part, we were, we were treated like kids. I will say that, you know, in regards to lifestyle and that sort of thing, I mean, we were, we were kids. The four of us loved to be together and had a lot of fun. And it was like living with, you know, my three best friends. And, um, but in regards to the dynamic, in regards to working, I don't have a, a real perspective on it because uh, we weren't really a part of it. Like we weren't a part of business conversations for the most part, for the most part. Oh, that's interesting. I mean, because uh, I know a lot of uh, younger uh, acts kind of get treated like adults in certain aspects where it's like, oh, it's just weird. So I think it's good that you don't have too much Inside well, they worked it, us. They worked us like workhorses. So, <laughs> but kept you out of the conversation. Wow. Okay. But but in regards <laughs> in regards to I how I remember being just playful kids. That's was the energy that I was most attuned to. Was what the four of us had. Um. But so yeah. But and, and of course we were, you know, listen to conference calls. But like how much. How much does a 14, 15 year old, 16 year old <laughs> understand? <True>. It's boring. <laughs> like, whatever. I just want to sing and dance. Like, whatever you guys decide. So, yeah. This, this is true, but that's, that's actually good, though, because some people really ooh, horror stories. But it seemed like in the beginning that yeah. Holly was actually chosen to be the lead singer. So, at the time, how was the decision made? And what were your thoughts on it at the time? So that was not a, <clears throat> so as much as like, I felt like we all still got to be kids and I loved being with the girls and stuff. There were a lot of dysfunction in regards to the team around us. And um, so, like I said before, we had recorded with Judith and Julio Iglesias' producer, but then once we signed with 2620 and Cl Clockwork Entertainment, Vincent Herbert became our Essentially, he's the one who gave us the dream sound, I guess, the, the sound architect for dream. So it was really Vincent. And I'm sure Debbie Hammond, who was, she owned Clockwork, had a part of it. So I'm sure it wasn't just Vincent. 
the Vincent was the the mastermind. You know, he was the creative genius behind it. So, um, so it was Vincent. Um, and and it wasn't healthy. Um, I I remember he isolated us from each other. So like. Um, I remember being in the recording studio and like he would isolate Holly away from us. And then we would spend what seems like days and weeks just isolated in a room waiting for him to call us if he ever did. Then they started to make us lose weight and get on a diet. So why, while Holly was in the recording studio, we would basically be like working with an instructor and on a very strict diet. Um, actually at this point, it was before Diana was even involved. I probably I didn't mention that Diana was brought on later. So it was Alex Chester, the original member that Judith had recruited to the group, um, was a part of this during this time. And, um, I actually spoke to her recently and she was like, yeah, they starved us. Um, it was, it was really bad. Um, so yeah, so we were forced to lose a lot of weight. I know for me, you know, I got to a place where, you know, it was borderline an- anorexia nervosa. It was bad. Um, and, but I will say in regards to uh, dreams blend and the mix, um, that was not Vincent. Um, Vincent was not responsible for essentially the blend and the harmonies and the things that the girls and I were capable of doing, and, you know, on our own, you know, as a, you know, acapella and just whatever. That was actually, I have to give credit to, there was another boy band <clears throat> that they were managing at the time, same production by the name of Heat. Uh, it was uh, Hassan Smith, um, Jermaine. I don't remember her Jermaine's last name. Forgive me, Jermaine and um, Craig. Same thing. I'm blanking. Um, wonderful, wonderful, talented men. Incredible. They were going to be like the next boys to men. I mean, the, the vocals were insane. And they were just kind people. And I, and they were older than us too. I don't remember how much older, not much. Maybe they were at least maybe in their late teens, early twenties. But anyway, so while, um, while Vince had Holly in the recording studio and when we weren't working out and losing, losing weight and that sort of thing, um, basically Hassan and Jermaine and all them would sit down with us and teach us harmonies, teach us how to blend teach us all of that. They would teach us riffing. They would teach us all sorts of thing, things. And, um, and yeah, and I remember, I remember one time, cause I just like any, any musician, right. You want to be heard. You want to be, you want to, you want to sing. Right. And for me, I really struggled with the fact that, you know, I went from basically doing musical theater where I did big belting. So like I was a singer, like a bit, you know, to all of a sudden be kind of silenced and like, not being asked to sing or showcase at all. Um, I would purposely like when Vincent would be in the vicinity, like turn on music and like be singing loud, like just so he could hear like what I could do too. And Hassan and Jermaine, I, I forget, I can't remember which one, but they, they did, they came to me one day. They're like, Mel, we just want to let you know that, you know, we, we brought it up to Vince. We asked like, Hey Vince, why won't you let Mel sing? And Vince's response was, she's going to get enough attention already. Whoa. And, um, and I just, and I, it, I remember just feeling incredibly helpless. So, so anyways, kind of rambled a bit because there's a lot there, but that was kind of the initial, what it was like to record initially at the foundation of Dream. So that's interesting. So then even in the studio, so you didn't even get to even try to record like the verses and the leads to the choruses. Like you, they literally just kind of had Holly go in and you just kind of went in and did harmonies above her. Initially. So imagine like, it felt kind of like a conditioning. So eventually they brought me in, eventually they brought Alex in, but it wasn't <laughs> without a very long time of essentially be going, going through all of that, the isolation, that making you think, there's something wrong with me. Um, so eventually Vince did bring me in and it was, uh, there was a track. I don't even remember if it was on the original album, but it was called, um, baby. I know you want me, baby. Yes. I, I think that was a bonus on track. On okay. Yeah. So that, all right. I don't, <laughs> so I don't remember. So anyway, so um, I recorded that song and he brought me in and I re I, I just remember him and it was my first time in the recording studio. And again, you would know that being a, a, 
a theater artist is a very different skill and technique than recording. Yes. So yes. I go in there as a 13, 14 year old girl and Vince expected me to know what I was doing. And I wasn't getting it <laughs> off the bat. And I remember him screaming at me like through the, like the, the glass mirror. I remember being in the very tight quarters. Um, and he was, I remember him being very threatening. Like, if you don't get this right now, I'm cutting you, you're out, like whatever. Um, and yeah, so I did get a chance to record and it was baby. And I remember hating that song of course, after doing that. Um, and, uh, but that, that was pretty much it. And then after that, when we were brought in occasionally, cause occasionally they would let us try out, but I don't know. I just feel like that when, when you're conditioned like that for so long, especially at such formidable years, I started to believe it or question my own ability. Right. Right. And it starts to manifest itself. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Like you saw you sabotage or like, I just became so hypercritical of my own sound that you can't. And you know, as like a singer, you can't be all like tied up in your throat yeah. and like, you have to Music is about expression and to be free in that expression. And unfortunately, that experience for me really laid a foundation for how I related as a recording artist myself and not feeling safe mm -hmm. and feeling like if I screw up, I'm done. You right. know, I cannot allowed to make a mistake. So yes, eventually they did. They would bring us in occasionally, but it, it was, it was it was very cemented that Holly's role was the lead singer and the rest of us had our own lanes that were eventually sort of created, cemented later. Wow. But it was very much stay in your lane. We heard that all the time. Whoa. Stay in your lane. Whoa. That's not your lane. That's Holly's lane. Whoa. Ashley, that's not your lane. That's Melissa's lane. We all had lanes. Wow. You know, yeah. it's, that's interesting because, um, I'm pretty sure you've seen K-pop now. That's how they actually operate. Mm. And it's very, very strict. Like they will say, this person, uh, Jenny is a visual. She's there to look cute. This person's a lead oh. singer. This person's the rapper. This one's a sub vocal. All you will hear them say is, ooh, ooh, ah, ah, baby, baby. So it's interesting that you say that now because people think it was it's just happening now, but it's always been, right? So. Oh, that's really interesting. I had no idea. I'm not familiar with K-pop. I don't oh, follow really? it, so. I don't really follow music in that sense because there's, there's, I'm still dealing with my own. I don't enjoy it the same. So kind of tainted a little bit. That <laughs> we'll get sense. to that. Yes. Yeah. Well, so going yeah. into the more business side of things. So now looking back, have you actually seen the record deal that you signed, like the contract and, and the terms? What was the negotiation for that like? And I'm sure it wasn't favorable, right? Um, yeah. So I recently, it's so funny you bring that up because recently I went back because I have all of the documents mm -hmm. and I just knew, and I don't know, I just innately knew like one day I'm going to need these. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I don't even understand what I'm reading when I'm reading it as a 37 year old woman. Like it's very confusing to me. Um, it wasn't a good contract by no means. I mean, I, I will say that Alex was a part of this initially when we had to sign our contract with clockwork entertainment in 2620. this, this, this was before we signed with Diddy it had nothing to do with Diddy. Um, they would not let our an attorney review our contract. They were like, sign this contract. So we were basically forced to sign a contract under dur duress. I had no idea. Essentially. Wow. Heck yeah, yeah. They, they made our parents. It was basically like, if you don't sign this contract, we'll replace your daughter. <gasps> and that's actually how Alex got cut because oh. her mom's an attorney and her mom refused to have her sign the contract. Wow. So she was essentially cut from the group. Huh? That's messed up. Yeah, it's messed up. So when we, we went into the contract in general, like, you know, it was like, you know, here's your, here's a dream. Here's your dream. This is what you want to do. I mean, and we just wanted to do what we love to do. And so I begged my, I mean, I begged my mom to not, not sign it. My dad was against it. Mm. My mom, my mom, I was like, mom, please. And she's like, <laughs> okay, honey. And, and it's that sort of thing where you think, you know, we'll fix this later. 
Yes. Yeah. Like if this is what you kind of have to do to get in, like you just, you know, you got, you got to pay your dues. Right. You know, but it's right. like, you should never have to sign a, a shitty deal in order to prove yourself. I mean, that's abusive. That's abusing new talent. You know, definitely it's horrible. Yeah. The artist has no power. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's horrible. But, but I have to say, I, I, I'm grateful that you all kind of was like, mommy, please, daddy, please. Because we got an, a very iconic song from that. He uh, loves you not. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So yeah. Dream's first single was the iconic He Loves You Not, released in August 2000. And the track was written by Steve Kipner, David Frank, and Pamela Shane and had huge success in the U.S. It peaked at number two on the Billboard Hot 100, number one on the Hot Singles Sales Chart, number three on the Hot 100 Airplay Chart, and it hit the charts all over the world too. Do you remember what your first impression of He Loves You Not was? And do you have any memories of recording that one specifically? I remember hearing the demo for the first time. It was at Holly's house. It was in Kenny's car. I think it was in Kenny's car. It was a demo. Um, I re Puffy didn't like the song. It was actually Clive Davis who picked it and basically told uh, Diddy to go sit down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it was Clive. So thanks, Clive, um, for doing that because you gave us a number one hit. Um, but yeah, it was. I loved the song. I remember us hearing it was that it was shopped to Britney first. At least she was one of the artists that they gave it to, or wow. they were trying to get give it to. Um, and, uh, you know, I liked the song. Um, I can't say that I listened to it and was like, oh, this is a smash. But I don't think I knew what a smash sounded like. <laughs> 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 it's a good song. Like, let's do it. Yeah, we love it. Um, the little girl actually, you know, he loves me, he loves you not. I can't remember if it was Steve or David, but it was one of their daughters. That's the, that's the voice oh. of... I can't remember if it was, yeah, which, which one, but yeah. So, uh, she's the one who did, uh, he loves me. He loves you not. And, uh, and yeah, and I loved genie in a bottle. So I was like, hell yeah. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know? So, uh, I do remember recording that. Um, I also felt a certain level after everything I had been through up until that point in the recording studio with Vincent and just the dynamics of all of it. Um, I will say that Steve and David let us all come in and audition. But they also made it very clear that the label made it very clear that Holly was to be the one singing solo on it. Wow. So, wow. but I appreciated the fact that they let us all go in there. And I actually felt far more safe with, with uh, Steve and David. Mm. And so in uh, that, that line, always looking for a new ride. Always that's all me, all the harmonies, everything. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I had to fight for that, you know, and I remember um, Steve and David being like trying to figure out how they were going to get because they liked the way I sounded on that verse. They wanted to give me the verse and um, that wasn't going to fly. So they're like, well, we really like how Melissa does this, this part of the verse. So Maybe we'll like, just like kind of sneak it in there. We'll not mention it. And hopefully nobody will notice that it's Melissa. So, but yes, that's me. <laughs> Go on. And that's me. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that was, uh, so that was a more positive experience in the recording studio. Um, you know, comparing it to the other ones. So good for you it's okay i mean first of all first of all i love that you know the whole he loves me loves you not you know it's so fun <laughs> um can i just say can i just say i was too young to know this song really I, i'm younger than chris so i'm i was yeah like, i was like four or five i don't know but okay. i remember the girl in the green shirt saying go and i was hurt every time because i couldn't speak and it was okay. you i was like oh my God, she's so pretty <laughs> oh, you're so sweet. I, I had to. Oh, God, how I became the like an ASMR person. I don't even know. Oh, let me go. Like it was it was my 
Hey, when you're looking to find, create space for yourself somewhere, like you do what you got to do. And apparently that was my, this is me. It was just like, I don't know. (laughs) It was so cool. No, seriously. Like to me, you were the cool one. Like I'm not trying to like, you know, like gas you or anything. I really just thought, oh my God, you know, because I was too young to know anything and I was too young to actually sing the words. Sure. (laughs) I made it really clear. And that's me. And that's me. Yeah, yeah, and the I said, I knew what? that's all I said. It was I never knew right. <laughs> so I was background usually. That was my part. Yeah, <laughs> so I played you a lot. So yeah, like... you subconsciously knew, <laughs> and like younger me knew this was going to happen like twenty something years later, right? Um, oh, but yeah. so funny. I love this song. Like, seriously, um, I had hit clips, and I had Britney Spears' "Lucky," and I think. Cool. He loves me not on it too. Oh, so this song, it. this song is like really, you know, special for a lot of people because it was just so fun. And mm-hmm. for me, I think I wasn't like I didn't know what a record label it was at like what at like a young age, but I knew that there was Total, and then mm-hmm. all of a sudden there's a new girl group, and we're like, they're white. Not yeah. trying to be funny, but you know, in the black community, you know, Bad Boy, Biggie, all that stuff like that. Yeah. So when we saw you girls, we were like. Oh my, they can they can sing, they can dance. So it was great. It was really awesome. And that music video, classic. Okay. Oh, thank you. Perfect. Again, green top. You're getting it. I love the pink <laughs> outfits. Ah! And then the nighttime desert performance. Like you ladies look so good. I know you all were really, really young, but it was just you looked confident. You looked really together and tight. And that rotating room, that iconic rotating room was like used in NSYNC's Bye 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 and Sugar Ray's Fly videos. Are there any memories or like little stories that you might have from recording the video? Yeah, well, <laughs> that's kind of funny. I didn't know this until I bumped into him later, but Chad Michael Murray is in the background of the desert scene. Get out. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> And he's the one who told me that I bumped into him. I bumped into Chad and I don't know him. We're not friends like that. So, um, but I bumped into him at a mall at some point. It was, I think it was prior to One Tree Hill or maybe it was right at the beginning of One Tree Hill because I had auditioned for One Tree Hill as well. Um, but yeah, so it was actually in the food food court. I bumped into Chad and he's like, hey, I know you or something. He told me, he's like, I was... I was in your music video. I was in the desert scene. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> I had no, I had no idea. I'm sorry. I didn't pay attention. Um, but yeah, so Chad Michael Murray, fun fact, was in the background at the desert scene. Um, the, the rotating cube was really fun. Um, I remember not liking my braids. I hated my braids. Um, but I remember thinking to myself, oh, gosh, who else has already done this? Gwen Stefani. If she can rock it with pink hair, I can do this. So Gwen Stefani was my muse, my internal muse. <laughs> to have some confidence on camera because I felt like I looked crazy. Um, you looked good. You looked good. I loved the, oh, Jennifer Lopez was part of, she did the final edit. She had a final say in the edit for a music video. Whoa, random, That's but so awesome. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> wait, wait, they were dating, right? Weren't they dating? Yeah, they were dating. And we actually, Jennifer <laughs> came to when I uh, went to the recording studio one time when she was doing, I think she was doing Made in Manhattan because she came in, she came dressed in one of the outfits that's in the movie. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> so bizarre. My life is weird. So um, yeah, we were in the recording studio and Jennifer came in. And uh, not to go on a tangent, but yeah, there was, there was some stuff there. She had me do my Britney Spears impression. I remember, I remember her doing her makeup and like immediately being like, what is she using? And it was Stilla lip gloss. And at that point I was like, that's all I'm wearing now is Stilla lip gloss. I saw Jennifer Lopez use it. (laughs) It's amazing. (laughs) And she's gorgeous in real life. Um, Stunning. Um, anyways, so, uh, so she yeah, she was part of the edit. Is there anything else about the, the music video? Um, not that stands out to me. I mean, I remember the, the makeup artist was super frustrated with the desert scene just because it was like constant caked up dirt. Um, yes. Dirty what makeup. Else? <laughs> uh, I remember where we bought our pants, the leather pants with the flames that was at a shop on Melrose. Um, the pink leather outfits, I still have them. I have everything in a box still. 
What? The oh garage. Um, yeah, we, that one was custom made and I could probably go and look at it and tell you later what, who the designer was who did it, but they were custom made. And what else? Um, I remember Holly's ripped and that's the reason why she didn't get on the dance, like that, the dance break. Oh, where she's just standing. There. Oh yeah. Well, you guys are doing a split. Yeah. I've always wondered why she didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Pants ripped. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> we constantly split our pants all the time. I could imagine. They were kind of tight. You guys turned around for the um, never going to make it with you or his hands aren't tied. And I'm like, kind of tight. Those pants are kind of tight. Oh, they were very tight. <laughs> no, we always popped our pants. I don't know. <laughs> we were underage, yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> right. You should have had us like checking that. <laughs> but you but know yeah. What? Oh, That's man. That's awesome. You all looked good doing the choreo, too. Just want to say that. That was very athletic <laughs> choreo, too. Yeah. It yeah. was very athletic. Yeah. Lorianne Gibson was our was our choreographer. That so it was the sense. same as making, making the band. Yeah. I think she was on that, too. Yes, yes, yes. Um, it all makes sense now. Um, so, of course, with He Loves You Not, it, come, it came on an album. And in January 2001, Dream released its debut album, It Was All a Dream, which debuted at number six on the Billboard 200 and was certified platinum. So you mentioned your experience recording this album, um, but this group does have a writing credit on the track Pain. How was the dynamic in terms of artistic input on your end versus the writers, Puff, and everyone else around you? What was that like? Puff wasn't actually involved in that at all. I oh. actually remember that during the time with Vince, that's when we recorded and wrote Pain, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, Kenny was very involved in it. I know Kenny has a credit or was supposed to, I don't know. Um, I did not like the, I did not like writing with everybody. I, I, I didn't like it. <laughs> Um, it just felt like too many hands in the pot. It felt, um, like everybody was trying to prove themselves. Um, I felt like for me, you know, maybe I was just too young, but I felt, I didn't know what I was doing. I certainly even didn't even, uh, identify myself really as a writer, you know, let alone a recording artist. So like being a writer and like, here, write a song now was, super intimidating for me. And, you know, everyone has such a different vibe and like the stuff that they like. So I don't know. I didn't really like the experience. Um, I actually have, that's so wild. I actually have the original, we recorded ourselves writing it. Oh. And I actually have that on, I have that tape. Really? Or we're making it up. Mm -hmm. I have Whoa. it on my computer here somewhere, actually. That's amazing. You seem to be like, to like the library of all the uh, dream archives. I respect that. Dearly. I have everything I have. I, I would talk to Ashley yesterday or was it the day before? Cause I have, we recorded ourselves on like wow. video camcorders. I have stuff with us like at Blockbuster acting like kids, just nerds. Um, our first trip to New York city with bad boy. Um, I have all of that stuff. So well, you know, we were blessed with this album. We were blessed with this album. And I think Chris, again, he was he was at the time in Hong Kong, but this Chris oh, can yeah. tell us. I was how obsessed. You felt. Like I, I wish I had the physical with me, but it's back at home. But that booklet is tattered. I took that thing out so many times to learn all the songs. Um, but yeah, I think it's a great girl group pop album. You know, it's got a great range to it. There's some groovy R and B tinged bops to it. There's a cover of New Edition. Um, and there are those interludes to connect everything too. Um, so it actually does sound quite mature. And looking back at all the critic reviews and things, they all said that you all sounded very mature. But so did you did you did feel they? a connection to these songs? And, and and also, did you have any say in actually like doing the sequencing? Which songs actually made it onto the album and like how you did the interludes? What was that whole process like? Or was it just kind of presented to you? It was pretty presented. Um, we improvised like the, uh, that interlude with the telephone. I think it was right before mm -hmm. telephone man. Right. Um, we improvised all that. Uh, I remember that. And Kenny, our manager, Kenny Burns is actually the voice in that interlude. Who's playing the boyfriend, Jordan. Oh my God. <laughs> so but I remember it, but we improvised all of it. 
So like, and I, and I, it's so funny to listen back to it. Cause we, I think we all wrote out, like we, not imp- like we improvised, so like we wrote our, like the lines. how we'd respond to Jordan, yeah. you know? So it was very authentic <laughs> to each one of us at the time. Um, so, but no, we had nothing to do with the sequencing. Um, I, I was happy with it. It was dream sound. Um, it wasn't my sound if I had done my own mm. album, which I thought about at the time. I thought about more at the time, to be quite honest, because I dreamed about doing my own stuff, mm-hmm. um, which I later got vict- oh, no, I later got in trouble for even having dreams and aspirations for myself outside of the group. Mm. Right. Mm-hmm. That's a whole other thing. But um, but yeah, I, I was very happy. I, I like dream sound. I had a lot of fun. It, you know, I identified it with, you know, as the four of us. And um, yeah, I was I was happy with it as much as someone can at 15. Right, right. I mean, it's appreciated because around yeah. that time I was super young, but you know, we like a good pop album. <laughs> yeah, it was good. Yeah, yes. I was proud of it. Um, when I get there, um, the the line about the wedding dress made me laugh a little bit. And I was like re-listening to it. I was like, why are they talking about getting married? But then I thought about it, like between 13 and 16, we're talking all kind of craziness, right? So it's just yeah. like puppy love. Um, but yeah, I, I really did. Um, I like this album. And I think, what was it? Um, was it How Long? How long? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm such a sap. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> but of course, this would not be it for you all. Um, even though he loves me not once. The lead single, we got a second one, of course, which is really exciting. <laughs> yes. Yes. So this in me. February 2001, Dream released its second single, This Is Me. This is me. And this was written by the same team that wrote He Loves You Not, and the song hit number 42 on the Billboard Hot 100 and number one on TRL's Video Countdown. And the song, of course, features the iconic Whispery Bridge and the amazing ending, Get a Grip. Get a Grip. (laughs) Um, What are your thoughts on This Is Me? (laughs) (laughs) You know what? I don't even remember recording This Is Me. How bizarre. I don't even remember the recording of it. Um, yeah, I thought it was a good single. It was, it was fine. It was good. Um, yeah, uh, I don't really have a whole lot to say about this is me. I mean, I, I vividly remember doing the music video. I loved the music video. Um, <clears throat> the memories that I have are so bizarre. Um, I, cause I was actually, I was, I was dating a guy at that time and it was, that was the day of the recording studio or at that ball doing the, um, the actual music video was not a good day for me relationship wise, Aww. but um, that's what I vividly remember is <laughs> heartbreak. But, um, but yeah, like I remember uh, just loving the rooms. I felt like the rooms I identified with my gold sparkly hallway. Um, and I remember the fitting that we did originally, they didn't want me wearing the camp, the camo leggings that I had. Right. Originally, I wasn't going to, we, I wasn't wearing anything oh. except for just the booty shorts. Oh. Oh my gosh. And my dad came in and was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean, dad? You know, 16 years old. What do you mean, dad? Um, <laughs> just completely naive and oblivious. He's like, no, you, you need to cover my daughter's legs. Um, and I remember we did, uh, I think the making of the video was there. Yes. If I'm remembering correctly, we did a making of the video, which was super exciting. I mean, that was like so super official. I remember being like, yeah, we're making the video. Um, <laughs> what else? Um, well, we have to talk about your bridge. I mean, you suck with the ASMR kind of. <laughs> kind of character that you had and you do this amazing bridge. So at least, you you know, you got to, you got to do something even though it wasn't singing, I guess. But like, do you remember how yeah, I that got to was? Talk. <laughs> yeah. I talking? I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I just talked, I guess. And I swear that was all Vincent too, because I remember when we did um, Baby, the song Baby, um, literally it is, you know, I'm, what you going to do, baby? What you going to do? Which is, first of all, I was 14 Ooh. and I remember it was like he was debating whether the word was going to be or the phrase was going to be what you want to do, baby, 
versus what you're going to do, baby. It was what you want to do, baby. And I remember telling Vincent, I'm like, mm, I don't know. I think I think what you're going to do, because in my mind, it was like, what you going to do, baby, <laughs> as opposed to what you want to do, baby. Mm-hmm. I don't know. You Which do. technically, but, uh, anyways, but yeah, so I guess for me, the talking was, I felt was, I got the stamp of approval. So I didn't feel as insecure about talk speaking in <laughs> a song, I suppose. It's okay. Because people don't know. <laughs> people don't know. I watched you on Regis and Kelly. And I'm like, okay, that whispering that she's doing, she's trying to sing it. You don't know how hard it is to sing that low when you're like a mezzo soprano and people are like, oh, uh-huh. hey, mezzo girl, sing down here. Uh, so kudos to you. Seriously. Thank you. Because I understand. So Yeah, much. that's all I did was bottom harmony. The notes are low and people need to appreciate it. Um, but I have to say, you're, you're, you call it like a little spoken part. I call it your little rap moment. And I'm kind of okay. upset that in the This Is Me rap. remix. What? <laughs> <laughs> Me either. Um, so, so, <laughs> I can't terrible. rap. I can barely rhyme. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, I have to say that in the This Is Me remix, I was kind of upset that Kane took your section. But yeah. Oh, there was, yeah. <laughs> there was a remix release of yeah. This Is Me featuring P. Diddy and Kane. And it was released the ha- and it had its own music video, which is awesome. <laughs> So what was your thoughts on the remix and the new video? We actually produced that remix. Okay, girls. Yeah. Nobody knows yes. that. Technically, it was mostly Holly and Ashley who, I, I will say, we did as a group, but it was Ashley and Diane, uh, Ashley and Holly took the reins on that. I remember we were in Miami. Uh, we recorded it in Miami. And, uh, and yeah, they took the reins and... Uh, they're the ones I remember coming up with even the harmonies. I'm not even sure who the producers were that actually got the credit on there. I remember I remember them in the studio being like, hey, if you guys want to do all the work, go ahead. And they just sat back like this. And then the girls took over. So I loved the remix. Um, I thought the remix was better than the original. Mm-hmm. Um, I always love to perform the remix. Um, and yeah, I. Yeah, I love the remix. I thought it was better. Yeah, it's first. great. The chorus it, like really holds its own against the original, mm-hmm. and it's a little cooler. But yeah, I do miss with like remixes were true remixes, like completely oh new God, recording, yes. different melody. Like that's really totally awesome. as opposed to just like a DJ like club yeah. mix where oh, you know they just change the track. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you do all look quite grown in this video, though. So like, were you mm-hmm. happy with all the styling? Because you guys, I would not have guessed you guys were only like 16 in there. (laughs) I was 17 at that point. They were 16. I was 17. And yes, that was the first time we actually, I feel like, had an actual budget. Um, Wow. So in the the final scene or where we're kind of like in that room and I'm shaking my butt, um, that was all Dolce and Gabbana. So I felt really good. (laughs) I was like, I'm in Dolce. I'm like, okay. We had somebody who actually knew how to do our hair. Like, oh, my weave looked good. (laughs) So I felt, um, and, uh, and yeah, I, the, the video, I mean, even in the, in the one black cube where we're all kind of wearing black, that's all Dolce and Gabbana. Um, in the white room, we were wearing like white Frankie B's, like, which is so classic to the time. Right. And like, just, I think it was just like a bad boy tank top or something that said bad boy on it. I can't remember baseball tee. Um, yeah, that, I mean, that was really fun. I, that was my favorite music video, I think, but that was random. Cause I remember I was home with my family and getting a phone call randomly one morning. And they're like, you're, you're doing the, this is me remix music video this morning. Oh, wow. We're sending for a car. Get in the car. <laughs> like, what? today was supposed to be a day off. Oh, <laughs> like, my nope. gosh. Well, so speaking so of like- the crazy schedule then, like, even just what's on YouTube, which I'm sure is very little of what you actually did in that time, the promotion for both of these singles, or all three of these singles, if you include the remix, looked crazy. Like, you performed on every TV show imaginable. You went international too. And then you also did tours, right? Like you opened for Britney in sync, went on the TRL tour. So 
how was it kind of being thrown into the crazy schedule? Like, were you were you doing homeschooling at the same time also? And like, just like, how are you balancing all of that? Yeah, so it was it, it was I mean, I worked we worked around the clock for I couldn't even tell you how long, like crazy work hours. There were times where we were I remember at one point we were in three different states in one day, like we took multiple flights and had multiple shows. Um, and then we, yeah, we always had a tutor with us and that's, I mean, they could speak more to where they cut corners and where, Mm -hmm. you know, what they had to get done. Mm. But like, like I remember our performances counted as PE. Um, (laughs) (laughs) that's amazing. (laughs) I mean, like we said, those dance routines were athletic, so it kind of makes sense, I guess. (laughs) Like (laughs) 45 minutes of cardio. <laughs> um, so yeah, we, we toured, uh, our first tour ever, I think was actually n- the Nickelodeon, all that tour. And that was with like LFO. I think everybody was on that. I think Bewitched was even on that at some point. Amazing. Aaron wow. Carter, I think was on that one. Um, and we were on the B stage. We weren't even on the main stage on the oh. Nickelodeon. That was mm. like, you really going to pay your dues. Like you were like on a festival st- stage, <laughs> like off the premises. So that's where we kind of started. And then, um, and then we did the oops, I did it again tour, which is where I initially met my husband. Um, cause he danced, he's one of Britney's original dancers. As you can see, that's her plaque back there. Oh, awesome. Yeah. It was given to my husband. Um, but, uh, yeah, oops, I did it again. And then we toured, we did a lot of radio dates, which were also radio tours, uh, we toured with 98 degrees, if not once, twice. Um, if we were not on one tour, we were on another one. Like it was just constant. Um, and then we toured the most with sync. So that's who we worked, were around the most was sync. Right, right. The no yeah. strings attached, right? Around that time? We did Pop Odyssey too, oh, yeah. which was their stadium tour. Um, and I think that was their last tour. Maybe it wasn't. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, as far as balancing, uh, we just, we just, we just went, you know, you just did what you had to do and you fit in the schoolwork, you know, that was the teacher's job <laughs> to make sure that we got it done. We did a lot of our schoolwork. I remember in the back of the bus, we'd have to sit down and do our math. And, um, I remember one, one of the things that, uh, one of our teachers did in order to help us with, I think our geography um, was whatever city we were visiting, we, and it would also would kill two birds with one stone. It was like geography and history. And we'd like learn something about the history in that state. Whoa, and I wow. remember specifically we were in Buffalo, New York, and I learned that that was the, <laughs> where Buffalo wings were. <laughs> <laughs> important and information. We were gonna go- <laughs> <laughs> Can you see? Yeah, important. That's where I learned about buffalo wings. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine oh, on a tragic. test? Can you imagine a test where were buffalo wings in? <laughs> that is the kind of education we got. It's tragic. Oh, truly, truly. Oh my goodness. <laughs> wow. Um. Yeah, buffalo wings. But speaking of history, you know. Um, The historic run of Dream was unfortunately kind of stalled due to September 11th, uh, 2001. Of course, New York was hit with a series of terrorist attacks. And with the country trying to recover and understand the horrific event, a lot of the music industry was put on hold, including you ladies and the remaining date of your TRL tour and promotion of the album. Um, And during this time, a version of In My Dreams featuring Bow Wow and P. Diddy was issued. And there were rumblings about Miss You and When I Get There being singles also. Um, Was that the original plan? And what would you have liked? to get to have been released as a single at that time i was told that it what i remember it was uh when i get there was going to be the next single and it was shelved because of 9 11 not because of it but you know with the circumstances mm-hmm. and everything you just right. said i'm not blaming right. the love on what happened <laughs> um but um anyways uh so yeah so it would have been when i get there and yeah, it was it was a really traumatic time. It also was a time of great reflection. 
um, I would say that was a really pivotal time for me when I was considering leaving. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and yeah, um, I remember going to, I remember us going and do and doing the Regis and Kelly live performance when I get there shortly after what happened. And that was like after the anthrax scare, like maybe a week after the whole anthrax scare at the NBC building. Right. And um, yeah, it was like, it was a really, really scary time. We were actually in the air when, it, when the tragedy happened. Um, we were flying, I think we were in Connecticut and we were grounded in St. Louis, Missouri. That's where our, they did an emergency landing. Um. I didn't know what the, t- <laughs> I didn't know what uh, the twin towers were because my, you know, my education was so excellent on the road. <laughs> um, so, but I, I remember getting off the the plane and hearing the, this, them talking about what happened. I didn't know what was going on, but I was like in the airport and I remember like walking through, like past all the terminals and like seeing, like I have a vivid memory of seeing the tragedy happening on a TV in like one of the cafes or something. And then we were all kind of just stranded like in the baggage area. And I remember like my friends calling me from junior or from high school, I guess it would have been at that time checking on me. Oh. And, and then we had to essentially, I guess, find a hotel. And then we eventually took a, a bus all the way back to California. Whoa. Okay. And that's how we got home. So but yeah, so when I get there, it was supposed to be the next single, and then mm-hmm. it never, never happened. Wow, that's so, crazy. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it was a it was a wild time. So, so mentioning the kind of self reflection shortly yeah. after that, going into two thousand two, it was announced that you had left Dream to pursue acting, which we know you've mentioned in other interviews that that was really a PR move and didn't reflect, you know, the complete truth. So here's your platform. <laughs> Why did you decide to leave Dream, and what was kind of your mindset at the time? Don't worry, your device is totally fine. You'll just have to tune in to part two of our Pop 101 Dream Class with Melissa Schumann for insight into her departure, solo activities, the group split, eventual reunion, and second split. See you there.